This month, uh, our theme of divine mastery, and before I get into all that, let me just say once again, it's a delight to be here and uh, so grateful for the hospitality and your board and your practitioners and all of the ways you guys have been leaning in and, and holding this place up and doing all of these roles. And now, don't all leave when I get here in July. <laughs> Talking to you, practitioners. <laughs> There's that sense of, whew. <laughs> Somebody else going to do this now. And I'm also keenly aware that there's a, there's a thing. People are saying, well, how are you feeling about it? I was like, well, I know there's this thing called the, uh, uh, called the when we get a new minister bucket. You know what I mean? it has been a lot of conversations. It's been like, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, when we get a new minister. Uh, what is, what is, how should we handle it? Well, when we get a new minister. So I know when I get here, I'm going to be brought this bucket taking it all out and going, oh, look, this has been in here since it's vintage, like 2017. <laughs> so be patient with me when, when we get started, okay? Uh, but I understand. Those are all part of the... But really, give your practitioners, your board, all the folks that have been serving a hand because they've done an amazing job. Yeah, they really have. And it's been a journey, and uh, we'll, we'll go home uh, after this week, uh, back to Portland, and um, wrap things up, and then come back in July, and continue to hold uh, affirmative thoughts for the process. You know, when we started this, I said, well, you know, ideally, ideally, right? You have to set the intention, and then let it go. Ideally, uh, and I forgot to start my timer, and if I don't do that, Lord, have mercy, you're in trouble. <laughs> All right, there we go. Ideally... Uh, we'll get the house on the market uh, right around Mother's Day. Um, that gives us a couple of weeks. It can have an open house and get some showings. Ideally, you know, I'd really, I'd really love it if while I was in Atlanta, my phone was ringing with offers. That would just be awesome because then we could be looking and then find something. And if we find something, then we can make a contingent offer on that and da-da-da. And if that doesn't happen and, you know, you have to completely surrender it and I've completely surrendered that and and people have stepped up and been so generous and people have said you can stay here if you don't find a house right away don't worry about it you can do this you, can. you all have been so wonderful and i'm so grateful for that and my wife patience and i are and so we've completely surrendered and we've even said well maybe we'll find something that we want but needs both of our incomes to qualify so we'll wait until we get here and then she starts working and we'll just kind of start over and we're okay with that and we surrendered and Offer came in yesterday on our house. I countered. They accepted. We're all good. In fact, in fact, while I was sitting here, my 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 iPad flashed, and and because I have my house uh, tagged in Redfin and Zillow, so I had all these alerts that uh, the property on Jacob Court in King City, Oregon, is now pending, and so. And to see that, and we've seen stuff that we like here, so we'll just keep affirming that all, that all continues to go in a gracious way. So it is. And that kind of feeds into how I want to set up today and talking about divine mastery, because uh, I did a little video this morning, which I, I like to do on Sunday mornings to get a little teaser of where I'm at in my meditation space and what I'm thinking about. Uh, you know, I've really come to the conviction that we're not here to become masters of of this realm. You know, it's not about, uh, in, in the old days in metaphysics and new thought, it was about the five Ps, right? Anybody remember what the five Ps were? Reverend Carroll, do you remember? Is it Prince? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you for your support. Uh, <laughs> it was all about manifesting. And then you came into new thought, you learned positive things, you learned about affirmations, and it was all about manifesting, and it was manifesting the five Ps. Princes, princesses, parking places, and palaces, right? But the truth is there's something much more mystical that we are up to and that we are about. And, and, and have, there's nothing wrong. You know, we're, we're looking at houses. We're looking at what we want. There's nothing wrong with setting intentions, using the creative law, and, and, and doing those things. Um, and, and having the car and the relationship and all of, if you're working on them, manifesting in those areas, that's wonderful. Don't get, don't get me wrong. It's just not the end goal. We do those things so that we have a platform to, to do something much more significant and important uh, in the world. And so I want to propose to you this morning some, 
some radical uh, notions and kind of begin to explore this and tee this up and um, my friend Reverend Raymond will uh, take it to the next level next week. I'm so glad he's coming and you get to have more time with him. Uh, he's absolutely fantastic and you want to be here for that. Uh, so let's have this radical notion. If, if reality shapes our consciousness, uh, or if, sorry, if reality is shaped by our consciousness, right? If we are um, using our consciousness, which is our conditioning, we've been conditioned as a child, we've been conditioned in our families of origin, we've been conditioned in our families of choice, we've been conditioned in our spiritual communities, in our nation, in our state or region, uh, in our culture, in religion, etc. We are conditioned, our consciousness is conditioned, and then we use that consciousness to project what we see or what we interpret or what we want to see or uh, all of those things, and we create our reality. Would you all agree with that this, so far this morning? So if reality is shaped by our consciousness, then in the process of living every day and moving about the world as ourselves and collective humanity, we continue to cultivate and co-create with the universe and we either create, promote, or allow all of the conditions that currently exist on the planet. Yes? yes. Create, promote, or allow all of those things to continue to, to be. So if that's true, then why are we creating the reality that we currently have, right? Why, why, why is my heart heavy and, and, and uh, you know, burdened with the need to bring in uh, 12 lives again that have been lost by another mass shooting into this space and, and think about that and contemplate that? Why do we have the political divisions? Why do we have the... Uh, the fights over gender equality and, and all the other things. I don't need to name them all. But why do we, if, if our reality is shaped by our consciousness, then why do we continue to create the rea reality that we have? And I would propose as an answer to that question one of two things. It is either because we, have become, we are here to become masters of the reality we shape and therefore learn how to, uh, at one level, be at home in the reality we create, and on another level, learn how to master it and how to basically manipulate it, right? How to, how to get what we want, how to um, uh, survive in the world, how to uh, have the experiences that we want, how to get ours over uh, somebody else getting theirs, and how to be successful. And so there's positive ways you could spin that, there's negative ways you could spin that, but uh, that's one thing I would propose to you. Maybe we are here to become masters of the reality that we create. Or maybe we have come here to become masters of the principles and tools of consciousness and thereby ultimately to be disturbed by our current reality. To be so disturbed by our current reality that we uh, initiate ourselves as motivated agents of change and transformation and evolution and that we are actually here to look, master the tools of reality or master the tools of consciousness that shape reality so that we can transform, transmute, uh, transcend and ultimately to become shapers and, and articulators of a new reality. Yes. Maybe that's really why we're here, yeah. right? So, so while it looks like we have to, you know, use the tools to get the relationship of the house and the job and all the things, that what I would propose to you is that's just child's play. That's low-hanging fruit. On the metaphysical tree, that is low-hanging fruit. Okay? Now, now, if it's new to you and unfamiliar to you, then it, it feels like the greatest thing ever, right? Because you're not a victim and you're not subject to the whims and all of a sudden you're empowered. So moving out of kingdom one to kingdom two, if you've taken some classes and learned the kingdoms of consciousness language, that's great. Right? It's wonderful, but it's still really low-hanging fruit. We're up to something much better, much bigger in terms of forging a new reality. In other words, you and I are not here to get comfortable with current reality. We're here to shape a bold new reality. We're here to shape a bold new reality. And newsflash, a bold new reality isn't a bigger house. Right? And that's a bold thing for me to say when I'm looking at bigger houses, okay? Right? But a bold new reality is not a bigger house. A bold new reality is a world in which homelessness doesn't exist. 
A bold new reality is one in which we say anyone who has served our country in military will never want for food, shelter, mental health care, anything that because they've sacrificed and given themselves to us and for our freedoms and we will make sure that we do whatever we need. I mean, the idea that there are homeless vets is like the biggest oxymoron in the world to me. It's like... That just And we have the resources and the ability, but it requires a bold new reality and articulate a bold new re reality. Uh, a bold new reality is one in which, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like it should be bold, but in, in our current situation it is. A bold new reality is one in which women have complete agency of their own bodies and is not governed by anybody, right? I, uh, no, I'm, gonna keep, I'm gonna be polite today, I'm gonna be polite. Mm. We got work to do. We got work to do. Yes? In other words, Wendell, Wendell Berry said it this way. He said, we have uh, lived our lives by the assumption that what was good for us would be good, good for the world. We have been wrong. We must change our lives so that it will be possible to live by the contrary assumption that what is good for the world will be good for us. And that requires that we make the effort to know the world and to learn what is good for it. That's where it's at. That's a bold new reality, right? That gives us out of our sense of self that requires uh, that, that there's a paradigm shift of, of me and mine to we and ours and that there's only one thing happening here. And there's no group of people more poised to, to help that shift for the entire planet than New Thought Communities because of our principle of oneness. But it requires us going deeper than the surface level of understanding of our principles. And that's what I want to begin to tee up and talk about today. So if you are here with me today to create a bold new reality, I want to say, first of all, congratulations, you're in the right place, right? The Spiritual Living Center of Atlanta is an amazing place to, to understand the tools of consciousness and to help uh, shape a bold new reality. It is not just a uh, church that is theologically more friendly, right? It's not... Hello. Right? This is, this is not just like, well, it's like all the potlucks, but none of the sin. That's not, that's not, that's not what we're up to here. Um, okay? Although that might be a cool t-shirt. Um, where's, where's the marketing committee? <laughs> all the potlucks, no sin. Sin free. Uh, that's not, right? This is a place that we are here to, to learn how to shape a bold new reality. And so if that's true, then, then get ready because here we grow. Here we grow. That the truth is that we are evolutionary beings designed for this work. We're evolutionary beings designed for this work. What we understand about how our mind works, our thinking, and how that moves out and creates reality around us, we are designed to be participants in the evolutionary consciousness of the planet. And so here's the deal. There is no challenge, there is no obstacle, there is no polarity, rift, uh, uh, thing, issue that the world is dealing with. There's no single challenge that the world or that you're in your life that you are dealing with that is bigger than your internal capacity to deal with it. Not just to deal with it, but to transmute it, to transform it, to transcend it. Why? Because in the principle of oneness, there's only one thing happening here. And that thing that seems so big and so uh, overwhelming and such a big thing to, to overcome and to, to, to um, uh, handle is actually your teacher. And it's here to, to, to agitate you to the point of finding your inner, inner resources. Anybody feeling agitated by what's happening in the world? <laughs> right? It's here to agitate. It's supposed to agitate us. I'm grateful when I get agitated when I watch the news. Because it says, I, mean, I need to find something within me to go forward and address that. I need to find something within me to address police brutality. I need to find something within me to address homelessness. I need to find something within me to address whatever is happening on the news because I'm not separate from it. I'm one with it. And it's here to, to our, uh, um, uh, activate me in such a way that I go deep into my spiritual practice. Not to get away from it, but so that I can come back to it and transform it. That's what we're here for. And if we really get that, we're going to have to knock down some walls. You understand what I'm saying? Because the only limitation that we have is the story that we tell ourselves 
about our capacity. The only limitation humanity has is the story that we tell ourselves about it. Our, well, we can't do that because. Well, we can't. In order for us to go forward in a bold new reality, there's an essential shift that is required, and that shift is in our sense of self, what we identify as our self. Again, moving from me and mine to we and ours. Martin Buber, the great Jewish mystic and theologian, uh, called, it, uh, uh, called it the I-we theological paradigm, right? Moving from that me and mine to we and ours. Uh, in his book, The Eye of the Storm, Unity Minister Gary Simmons uh, talks about the four winds of conflict. And I want to speak to them to, to, to you about them today in the terms of this, these being the four aspects of false narrative that keep the old sense of self, the sense of self that's isolated and uh, wrapped up in, in, in propping up this current reality that we have that is not working for us, um, that, it's, that it's underpinned by these uh, four narratives. Gary Simmons calls them the four winds of conflict that blow when we get into conflict in our life. But they are these uh, four and then how we address them. Uh, number one is a sense of separation. Anytime we feel separate uh, from our good, separate from our source, separate from each other, separate from those folks over there, separate from what's happening uh, in the news or around the world, anytime we have a sense of separation, that is a wind of conflict or what I would say is a false narrative uh, playing itself out. I say it's a false narrative because we know that there's one power, one presence, one life moving in through and as all things and all creation. And so anytime we feel a, a sense of separateness, we have bought into a false narrative about who we are. Yes? yes. The second is a misperception. A misperception blows as a wind of conflict and blows as a false narrative because uh, the sense of misperception means that we tend to think very, A, very highly of ourselves, uh, right? My friend Dr. Ken Gordon likes to say, well, this is my opinion, of which I'm very fond. Uh, right? And you and I, no matter, no matter how much we think we know, we never know the whole truth. We never see the whole picture. We only see the, the piece that we're looking at. But we tend to think that, well, I've got, you know, don't pat yourself on the back because you have a spiritual perspective about the world, right? Rather than a religious one or rather than a whatever one. Uh, you know, I like to say um, self-awareness is the booby prize in metaphysics. It's the booby prize, you know. Ooh, I'm self-aware. Uh, yeah, in your separateness from the rest of the world and this <laughs> suffering that's happening, c congratulations. <laughs> right? It's not. It's. <laughs> it's not where we want to. Am I pushing you a little bit? Yeah. Is it okay? Can I keep going? Yeah. All right. Sense of separation, perception. So we never have the whole picture. We have to broaden our perspective by talking to others and seeing things from, from uh, different uh, angles. The third is competition. Oh, good. I'm good. Um, the third is competition and the sense of competition, where there has to be winners and losers and uh, we have to fight for what is ours, all of those things. And the fourth is defensiveness. Anytime we feel a sense of defensiveness. Now, I want you to think about those four things for a minute. Separation misperception, competition, and defensiveness. Our entire form of government is based on those four things. Uh, there's so much of our worldview. I'm not picking on politics, but, but that's just one place you could look. Our whole sports, uh, I mean, so much uh, media, marketing, how they get you to buy new things is all based on those four things, making you feel separate, right? Making you think that, well, if you have this, then you'll have the, the perception, the viewpoint that is the right one, right? If, if, you, if you're over here, then you'll win the competition and sense of defensiveness. And the world paradigm that I talked about before is that, that a lot of people are trying to master those four attributes. They're trying to master that game, that reality. But what we want to do is step into a mystical path where we begin to master a new reality. And we do that by uh, addressing these four attributes by coming from an internal sense of peace, wholeness, and awareness. And those four things are from separation to communion. Now, when I first started studying and reading this stuff, I thought the answer to separation was a sense of oneness. 
Anybody think that? Yes. I, if I feel separate, well, then the answer would be oneness. Nobody wants to raise their hand. It's okay. I thought it. Congratulations. <laughs> right. I thought, I thought, oh, it's oneness. But here's the thing. Oneness, oneness again, is kind of, it's, uh, I don't know why booby prize is my phrase today, but it's kind of like the booby prize to sense of separation. Be why? Because oneness is a principle. Oneness already is. So if you're feeling a sense of separation and then you say, oh, well, what I really need to do is come from a sense of oneness, it's like you're stepping outside and saying, oh, the sun is shining. And then congratulating yourself for having the perspective that the sun is shining. <laughs> like, you're not really saying anything that dramatic, right? I know, I know you all like appear as mystical masters to your friends and family because you go to <laughs> Spiritual Living Center of Atlanta and you have this cool, interesting, inclusive, oneness language and perspective about the world, and, and they all think you're some radical mystic because you believe in oneness, but don't let other people's, you know, propping you up for that, don't let that fool you, because oneness is. That's not new. The universe is based in that. Now, other people might not see it the way you see it. That gets into perception. So the answer to a sense of separation is not oneness, it's communion. It's connecting with that oneness in a deep, mystical way. It's communion, it's spiritual practice, it's dedication to living that oneness. It's being so in love with courting the presence of God and then seeing it everywhere. It takes work to commune with God when you're wrapped up in a sense of separation and when you're living in a world that is tied and committed to a sense of separation. It takes real work. Now, here's the other thing. This is, this is your bonus today for coming. Thank, thank you very much for being here today. So your bonus is this, is that uh, in, in this work, um, that in, in the mystical sense of, of, of oneness and communion, uh, don't think that, that the work of communion is simply uh, the mystical experience, right? Like, you know, trips to Egypt and deep meditation and like... You know, nothing wrong with that. You got the money, the resources, you want to travel and see the great mystical sites of the world, that's fantastic. Um, I, I would simply ask that you include in that trip uh, a sacred sense of service to those who are suffering. Right? It's one thing to see the great, you know, seven wonders of the world, but serve some people while you're doing it. Why? Because, because what is really mystical... What is really mystical is not people who can pull themselves out of a world of conditions that we currently have and, and wrap themselves in the mystical uh, um, uh, garb of, of ancient history. That's actually privilege. Oops. That's actually, right? And again, it's wonderful. You have the reason, that's fantastic. I plan to do that. My wife and I want to do that. It's wonderful. But what's really mystical is being able to roll up your sleeves and get down in the streets and to work to solve homelessness. What's, you you want to see a mystic? Pay attention to William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign. Yes. That's a mystic. Oh, yeah. That's a mystic. One who can see God in the midst of the suffering of humanity and know our oneness. So communion is a deep, and so we come here to commune in the wonderful safety and wholeness of this place, but we do that communion work so that we can go out and be in communion in our everyday life. Let me bring this to a close. So communion is the first one. Maybe I should save the, for the next three for next time I come. No, no, I'll give them to you. I'll give them to you, don't worry. Communion. So we, uh, we, then we handle misperception through the practice of principle. Rather than, is my view right, which has come from ego, we say, am I seeing this from principle? What is the spiritual principle here? Which has nothing to do with whether I like it or not, or whether it agrees with my perspective or values, but rather, what is the principle? And you say, well, which principle? Whose principle? Well, if you ask me, there's really only one spiritual principle happening in the planet. That is that God is all that there is. God is all that there is, all the time. And if that's true, then how am I viewing this thing in a way that allows me to connect with it, commune with it, befriend it, and address it from my wholeness rather than a sense of separation? Am I viewing it from principle? And there's lots of nuances of the principle in terms of circulation and love and giving and receiving and all of those sorts of things, but basically it comes down to one thing, and that is God is all there is. 
we handle the sense of competition in the world with a sense of purpose. I don't need to compete with you. I don't need to compete with other, any other home buyers out there. Right? If, I, if I come from a sense of wholeness, I'm coming from my purpose. There's not winners and losers. There's simply me living. That's why I start every talk by saying, my name is David Alexander. I've come here to be so that I'm reminding myself and those who are hearing me what my purpose is. I've come here to be an um, inclusive, prophetic, and courageous voice for God. That's my purpose. And if I'm living my purpose, then all the resources necessary for me to fulfill my purpose come to me and come from me and circulate around me. And I lack nothing. And I'm not in competition with anyone. So, so I want you to know that as we begin this journey together, starting in July, that, that in classes and in work that we do together, I'm going to get everybody here to be able to say what I say. Not my words, but your own purpose. My name is, and I have come here to be. Because I want you so clear about what your purpose is on this planet. That everything comes to you. You're not in competition for anything. In your workplace, you're not in competition in your relationships, you're not in competition financially, you're not in competition for anything. You are here as a purposeful being, on purpose, in purpose, surrounded by purpose, and God doesn't create anything and then, and then uh, subtract from it the resources that it needs in order to fulfill its destiny. You have a divine design. You have a design, divine design, and that divine design is a purpose, and you're going to learn how to articulate that if you don't know already. And the fourth one is the most challenging, which is uh, battling the winds or the attributes of non-resistance, or sorry, with defensiveness with non-resistance. We all like to get defensive. I know you don't want to admit it. <laughs> well, we like to get defensive. We like, we like to, we like to uh, uh, justify our position. Especially on Facebook. <laughs> oh, oh, is that so? Well, did you ever consider? Mm -hmm. Look at this link and read this, right? That's why I call it today spiritually woke because there's so much desire in humanity right now to, to, to. You got to, you know, if you're if you're alive and paying attention, you got to be woke about everything. You got to be woke about gender issues. You got to be woke about. Uh, race relations, you got to be woke about financial things, you got to be woke about politics, you got to be, you got to, you know, and, and God forbid you say something, somebody else says, oh no, did you know that that's a, oh. there's lots of learning going on, which is good, right? But we handle what comes up for us as a sense of defensiveness with non-resistance. When you're in your purpose, you don't need to resist. You just let it go. So it's spiritual Aikido. Right? Defensiveness of some, someone else comes at you and you just... Right? Raymond, you better tell Raymond that I did that. Okay? Because he's really good at that stuff. He does all the martial arts stuff and incorporates it into his talk. So you tell him. Right, we, we saw that last week. You tell him. Communion, principle, purpose, and non-resistance. These are the attributes of wholeness that we come from to handle forging a new reality. Jesus said it this way. They will know you by your loving. That's it. Ernest Holmes said it this way, and then we're going to pray. Ernest Holmes says, humanity and divinity will be identical when we recognize divinity in humanity. We must learn to see through the apparent, to judge not according to appearances, to realize at the center of every person's soul God is enthroned. Yes. Humanity and divinity will be identical when we recognize divinity in humanity. We must learn to see through the apparent, to judge not according to appearances, to realize that at the center of every person's soul is God enthroned. That is divine mastery. That is being spiritually woke. And that is what we are committed to in this journey together you and I. That is worth our tithes, our resources, our time together to build a community that is dedicated to that. And I guarantee you, we'll create a vibration that will transform the planet starting right here in Atlanta. And I'm so grateful to beginning, to beginning this new journey with you in continuation of my journey and my calling of spiritual practice. Thank you all very much. Namaste. <laughs>
so much.